Hi, this is Laura Chapel, and this is Wireshark Tip 3. Now, if you want to follow along with the Wireshark Tip series, you can follow me on Twitter at Laura Chapel. In this tip, I'm going to show you how to graph HTTP.time, that's HTTP response time, which is a new feature that came out with Wireshark 1.10. So I've opened up a trace file called http-wireshark-download.pcapng. And you can see in this trace file we have a get request to, uh, to download the page called download.html. Now, if you didn't look back at tip number one, you might want to do that because I'm going to change this setting for TCP. I actually want to see the response code right here in the packet in which it actually occurs rather than way down here. The response code is actually right here in frame number six here. I can actually see it down in the packet bytes pane. So to make that change, I'm going to select the TCP header, right mouse click, protocol preferences, and uncheck allow subdissector to reassemble TCP streams. Now we can see the response code in the info column. So here's the new field that came out with Wireshark 1.10. And you can find the new field when you expand the HTTP header section in the detail window. So as I go down to the bottom, we will see HTTP response one of one, and there is our HTTP time field. And you can see when you highlight that line that down on the status bar, Wireshark tells us the display filter syntax, and display filters are what we use in our graphs. So I'll be using that to graph my HTTP response times. We can also right mouse click on that line and add it as a column, which is a great thing to do for HTTP analysis. I'll right mouse click and choose apply as column. And now I have a new column that says time since request. I can click on it twice to sort from high to low and then go to the top of the list to see the highest response codes. And we can see that there are some pretty bad response times. I mean, I would expect to see times faster than this. Uh, 202, almost 203 milliseconds, just for the server to come back and say OK when I made a request for a simple GIP file. So now I'm going to build a graph that will show me where I have spikes in the HTTP response times. I'll go up to Statistics and IO Graph. And of course the default IO Graph is to show us all of the traffic, and I really don't care about that, so I'm going to turn off graph number one. In graph number two, I will simply enter in the filter HTTP.time and then turn on that graph. And this shows me that there's a spike in time right up towards the beginning of the trace file. I can move that down a little bit out of the way. And we can also apply this to other trace files. And, and remember that this is summarized for the one second interval. So we may want to move in just a little further to see a more granular view of response time delays. So here we can see we have a number of uh, delays that are showing up at the beginning of this trace file. And then four seconds into the trace file, we start seeing some more delays. I'm going to leave this graph window open. Don't close the IO graph window when you move from trace file to trace file. Wireshark will automatically recreate this graph based on the next trace file you open. So I'll open up a trace file that I know has got some pretty serious delays. The trace file is called HTTP-Facebook. And this is one of the trace files that you can get from the wiresharkbook.com website. So here it is, and I can already see in my time since request column, I've got a pretty high number in here. But I'm going to toggle over to my graph, and then looking through the graph, I can see the points where I have some higher delays in this graph. And we can see that it's applied the graph to http-facebook.pcapng. Remember that you can always sort any column that you add. So if I go to the top here, I can see this packet right here, um, frame number 11. Oh, I didn't mean to move that. Let me move that back. I moved my source column. Uh, frame number 11 shows up with a tremendously high delay here, 3.4 seconds before the server turned around and said 200 OK. Let me give you a warning here on graphing this information. When I first started showing you this, uh, this process in Wireshark, 
I mentioned that I set my TCP reassembly off. Let me take you to that first trace file that I had open. It was HTTP Wireshark download. And we can see in this trace file there's SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and there's the GET request, there's the ACK, and there's the 200 OK. Notice the time value. It's a little over 44 milliseconds. I will turn on that TCP reassembly setting, which is the default for Wireshark. And let me bring it down a little bit so it goes up there. So I'll go back to the default setting in Wireshark to allow Subdissector to reassemble TCP streams. Now this will change the results that I get in my graphs, so it's important that you turn off that setting. If the setting is on, this is what I'll see. I'll see the GET request, I'll see the ACK, and then I see TCP segment of a reassembled protocol data unit, or PDU. This is actually the packet that contains the 200 OK. That's the packet that contains my response code, though, my 200 response code. And that's the packet that I would like to have timestamped as the response packet. But instead, because I have reassembly enabled here, I can see that Wireshark shows me TCP segment of reassembled protocol data unit. It keeps going, keeps going, ACK and everything. And then the last packet of the download for that item, that page, is the one that is timestamped. So that would give me an artificially high uh, TC or HTTP response time if I left that setting that way. So make sure when you're analyzing HTTP traffic that you have your TCP preference setting for allow subdissector to reassemble TCP streams off and that will give you an accurate HTTP round trip time. If you'd like to follow along with this Wireshark tip series as I release the tips on Twitter, you can follow me at Laura Chapel. For more Wireshark tips and training, visit chapelu.com.